Welcome to To The Point. The 2024 presidential election is more than a year away, but make no mistake, the next few months will be pivotal in determining who will be on the ballot. Right now, Biden and Trump are the front runners, but we also have polling that suggests many people want some other candidate. Enter No Labels, a group trying to field a third party ticket that they say will be bipartisan. In a normal election cycle, launching a third party would seem like a long shot, but this is not a normal cycle. And given some of the people involved, experienced office holders themselves, it is at least possible that the third viable choice could end up on your ballot next November. How would it work? Former Congressman Fred Upton and former Michigan Senate Majority Leader Ken Sikma talk about that this week. Gentlemen, thank you both for being here. This is an interesting subject that we're going to talk about today, and we're going to talk a little bit about how we got here. But the idea is no labels, and that is having somewhat of an independent approach to the upcoming presidential election. Fred, talk to me a little bit about what the overall premise is of this group that you've been working with uh, for a number of years already. Well, no labels has been around since, I think, 2008 it's been primarily focused on legislation. Like, how do we get out of this gridlock that we see constantly in, in D.C.? Uh, it's been bipartisan, bicameral, so both the House and the Senate. And they've really put people together and said, you know, what is it that we need to do to be able to govern? So huge impact on the infrastructure bill. We changed it uh, dramatically from where Biden was uh, at the beginning. Huge impact on CHIPS legislation in terms of what the Congress did my last year in the Congress uh, to help particularly the auto industry and appliance and, and ev everything else. Uh, and uh, it, at this point, they've recognized that many Americans are saying, we don't really want a rematch between Trump and Biden. We've, we've done that before. There are almost majorities in both sides now that don't want this to happen again. And so what this, what No Labels now is looking at is to really get on the ballot and be able to turn it over, if in fact it ends up being Biden and Trump, to be able to turn it over to a, a bipartisan ticket and let them run and actually provide a choice other than Biden and Trump to try and get things done, and one that would be bipartisan. Senator, it's been a long time since you and I have had a chance to sit down and talk, but what brings you to th this point and participating in No Labels? And I, I should point out that <clears throat> both of you were in leadership of your parties when you were in office, Senate Majority Leader, Chairman of the Energy and Commerce. You were not passive participants, so you were very involved in the Republican Party, but now you're looking at this and saying you need something else. How did you get there? Well, I'm a private citizen now. I, I haven't been in elective office for 17 years, but politics has taken to what I think is an alarming turn. Um, the, the political parties, uh, it's in their interest now to polarize uh, and emphasize the differences in, with Americans. I mean, we, we do have differences, political differences. Uh, we are a polarized country, but the parties are making those differences sharper the polarization deeper. And that's not the kind of politics that I want. Um, I want a politics that allows for vigorous debate for differences when there are differences, uh, but also a, a politics that recognizes when you come to govern, you've got to find um, a consensus solutions. Uh, and I don't, I don't have a voice today with a Trump-Biden ticket. And the reason I uh, am supporting no labels is they give a voice, they give um, structure, and they give national gravitas to the kind of politics that I want to see in America. So I'm all in. When you think about this concept, and, and I'm going to just tell you from the abstract, that I, I think about what is the possible. And in my lifetime, we won't say how many years, <laughs> I've watched a number of presidential races. We have seen attempts at a third party. The most successful that you have referred to in the past was Ross Perot, and it's been a number of years ago. How do you, with any type of certainty, come to a ticket, if indeed, and I want to get to this other concept too about it's got to be Biden and Trump, we'll talk about that, but do you come to a ticket that isn't something other than a spoiler? Well, a couple of things. <clears throat> when you've had those spoilers before, let's take Ralph Nader, Jill Stein, others, they've been pretty marginal in terms of the actual vote that they got, a couple percent. 
Uh, Ross Perot actually at its high point was at I think 38 or 39 percent back in in 92. Right now we're looking at the approval rate and uh, you know of, of either Biden or Trump at under 40. Guess what? 39 percent wins. Uh, especially if we have this gridlock that we're you know, likely to see uh, as it plays out uh, later this month with a possible shutdown and, and everything else uh, that's going on in the world. So rather than being a spoiler where you just, and, and for both those candidates, Nader and Stein, they really took just from the Democrats. Right. We know from our own polling that this actually takes the uh, uh, ticket that no labels is, would be able to offer Again, the candidates will be running that, not no labels itself. Um, actually draws from both sides, equally from both sides, uh, Trump and Biden, and provides, I guess you could say, an insurance ticket or uh, uh, you know, a, a different balance, but a one with a pathway that actually can win. Uh, and we've seen this now in, in polling, just recent polling again now, in, in eight critical states, one of which is Michigan. Uh, Ken, you, you talked about you don't have a voice, you don't have any place to go. How prevalent do you think that is among people who remember politics of a different era? And, and you know, I don't want to make it sound like it was all sunshine and roses when you were in the state legislature. You certainly had issues, uh, particularly as Senate Majority Leader. But, but how many people do... We, how, I don't know how you put your thumb on it. I know you've got polling. But there, there are a lot of people who have been very involved particularly in the Republican Party in the state of Michigan, who has just walked away. Well, the, the most recent poll, and, and Fred alluded to this, 70% of Americans don't want to see a Trump-Biden ticket. Now, someone's got to explain to me how 70% of Americans become defined as a spoiler. Uh, the fact of the matter is that those polling results and the fact that the favorability for both Trump and Biden is 40 or below, there's a huge opening for the kind of um, initiative and movement that no labels represents. I don't have any interest in being involved in a, uh, a movement that just becomes a spoiler. But when 70% of Americans are looking for an alternative to Trump-Biden, that's not a spoiler. It, that's an opening. Now, it's a long time between now and next April when no labels is going to have a national convention, and certainly even a longer time between now and November of 2024. So a lot of things have got to ha happen and fall into place. But No Labels uh, is committed to pursuing a viable alternative. Viable alternative means a realistic chance of winning the presidency um, with a different kind of politics. It's different than the politics of polarization that we see today. It's not different than the politics that I grew up in and represented when I was in the legislature. Talk to me for just a minute about the parameters. And you said this in a previous uh, interview that we did and we talked about it, but this whole idea is predicated on the idea that both Biden and Trump are the nominees. If either of them are not the nominee, are you guys out? Probably so. I mean, that a uh, decision will be made uh, in terms of the, the viability of that. I mean, we've got a long way to go. I mean, our primary focus now is ballot access. So we're on the ballots in 11 states. Michigan is not going to be on there. We're not going to work on that until next year for a variety of reasons. Uh, but we're on 11 states, and that's the first thing. And Perot got on all 50 states. So we, we, we think this is absolutely doable. Uh, but the other thing that we worked on and we unveiled back in July in New Hampshire was a common sense, and I forgot to bring mine, <laughs> but a common sense publication on issues that we think the American public actually supports that we can embrace, that we helped write. And viewers can see that on nolabels.org. There's a website there. You can pull it up. It's real easy to do. But whether it's you know, hey, we shouldn't be punting on Social Security. Uh, crime is important. What are, what are we doing about that? Immigration is an issue that, again, we don't want to run away from. Uh, we shouldn't be spending more money than we're taking in. A whole number of what very much are like maybe the contract with America back in 94 that the co turned the Congress around, we have now come out with these uh, solid proposals for people to view, and uh, that is part of the legislative process, again, that's something that no labels have stood for the last number of years of, you know, let's just end this gridlock. W what is it that we need to do to, to work together to move the ball down the field? 
You both bring a lot of experience to the table. Kim, what is your role? What do you see you d doing uh, with no labels as it moves forward? Because obviously, like you say, you're trying to get on the ballot in states. Michigan's going to be one of them. What, what is your role going to be? Well, I, I'm a private citizen looking for, what, as I mentioned, a national organization uh, that represents the kind of politics I believe in. And, you know, I'm going to do whatever I can in a very limited role in a, one state to advance the cause. I, you know, I'm glad that Fred talked about the kinds of things that No Labels is doing now that would actually um, ensure that they don't run a third party ticket. Um, had this common sense agenda, trying to influence the political debate between now and November. Um, maybe even influencing who the nominees are on the Democratic and Republican side. It doesn't look like that's going to happen, but no labels with their common sense agenda is trying to do that. We might get to a point next year, uh, Rick, where there is no need uh, for a new labels movement because the nominees might not be Trump and Biden, might not be in that position. Um, but there are things that can be done between now and then to, to influence that, and, and no, no Labels is, is engaged in that. You know, you, you bring up an interesting point because it does feel, and again, it's nothing in the tea leaves, just kind of the feeling that for all of the polling, and I look at it every day, that shows that both Biden and Trump have big margins over any of their competitors, it still doesn't seem absolutely certain to me that they're going to be the nominees. There seems to be on both sides enough issues that you wonder if, if that isn't going to change. How, how well, likely do you think I, that is? I've always thought your political intuition was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, and so you say I, that now. Yeah. Yeah, he still never, has that sigma bumper sticker on the back. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you're right. I mean, you know, you have on the one hand, you, you, you have sort of a paradox, I think. You know, if when you ask uh, people, um, you know, you ask Republicans, you know, who would you want the nominee to be, or you ask but Democrats, who do you want the nominee to be, uh, almost a majority say not Trump and not Biden. Um, you've got over almost 70 percent of American public saying they don't want to see that ticket. And yet when you ask the question in a different way, it looks like it's Biden and Trump. It's a paradox. Um, but I think your intuition is is accurate that there's a lot that can happen between now and next spring or now and next you know, Super Tuesday of next year. Um, there might not be a need, as I've said, for uh, a new labels movement in the sense of a third party ticket. I do think uh, no labels has to stay around to influence uh, the kind of politics that I want to see a politics that doesn't emphasize the differences between Americans and that doesn't sharpen the polarization that does exist. When we come back, what would happen if you elected a president and vice president who were not nominated by one of the two major parties, while virtually all the members of Congress would have an R or a D by their name? I put that question to our guest next, To The Point. Welcome back to To The Point, an effort's underway to put a third-party bipartisan presidential ticket on the ballot for next November. We continue our conversation about that with former Congressman Upton and former State Senator Sycamore. If you will, talk to me about the process, because you already said you're trying to get on the ballot in all these places. Some places, like Michigan, you pointed out, that effort won't really be in full swing <clears throat> Pardon me, until next year. How difficult is that when you don't, and I realize that you're growing all the time and you have this group, but it's not like the Republican Party or the Democratic Party that has automatic access. How tough is that and, and how expensive is that? Well, we got smart people. Uh, first of all, every state is a little bit different. We also know that both the Democratic National Committee and the Republican one, DNC and the RNC, don't want us in the game. They like the sandbox with just the two of them and, and not with a third party alternative. But every state's different. Maine needs 5,000 signatures. Uh, you had to file, you know, report on my little, like a four by five card, you, your name, your birth date, uh, your address. It had to be certified that, yeah, that really is your signature on there, certified to the Secretary of State. It's, it's different. Michigan, you need 47,000 signatures, and all the money that is used to get on the ballot has to come from your same, your own state. 
Uh, so, but it's the same, we, we're treated, we should be, as any other third party group. So, whether it be the taxpayers party or the Green Party or, you know, the Communist Party, whatever, um, you know, if they're on the ballot, they have to go through the same thing. But we also know that the litigators from both the DNC and the RNC, they don't want us there. They know the positive impact that, that we can have and uh, with a pathway to win. So they're putting, trying to put up roadblocks every step of the way. They, they took us on in Arizona, we won. They took us on in North Carolina, we won. Uh, Maine will win, but uh, that's, that's in play at the moment. But we're doing everything, crossing every I, or dotting every I and crossing every T uh, as, as, the, as, as we go. Um, the budget, for we think we have enough money to do, do it. It's uh, in the tens of millions of dollars. We've raised that money and we're... We're off to the races. You have uh, uh, a lot of folks who have been in the game of politics for a long time. Yourself, others, Larry Hogan, the former yep. governor of Maryland. So Larry Hogan and uh, Pat McGorry, two former Republican governors, are the co-chairs along with Ben Chavis, former head of the NAACP, as well as uh, Joe Lieberman, who of course was on the ticket uh, a couple decades ago. Right. But those are the two, four national chairs. And uh, particularly, uh, Governor Hogan has been making the rounds in the national talk show. I mean, this is getting traction. It is. You know, and, and I say that without understanding exactly what the impact might be. Let me leap ahead for just a moment, and I'll ask you, because you've served at the federal level, if the tickets remain what we think they're going to be, Biden and Trump, if no labels is successful in getting on enough um, ballots uh, in states across the country, and if you come up with a ticket that resonates with folks, that would be the first time in American history that you would have a president serving that doesn't have a single elected member in their own party in the House or Senate. So two questions. How is that going to work? And second, if this all comes to be, will no labels expand? to book candidates down ticket in elections yet to come? Well, the easy answer is to your second question, no, they're not going to expand. This has been a Herculean effort as it already has been, and so we're, we're, only, gonna, we're only looking at a presidential ticket, Republican and a Democrat, uh, not, don't have the particular order yet. Uh, I'd like, as a Republican, I'd like to think it would be a Republican as, the, as uh, president. How would it work? Well, you have this common sense principle. This magically appeared. Yeah, magically uh, appeared. Uh, my, my crew had it off to the side, but here it is. I left mine on my desk, read it a number of times. But it would. this would be the agenda. It's like, okay, guys, how do we work together? You know, it's, it's sort of like probably what Ken did when he was in the state senate. Sometimes you get in that room and you say, how do we get this done? How do we avoid a shutdown? How do we work to make sure that our defense is strong? How do we... What do we do for our communities uh, to make sure that they're safe? What do we do on education? A lot of it is right here. And having a Republican and a Democrat who could go to each of the different parties' caucus and say, you know, we won, the gig's up. We know what happened with your candidate and, and you know, pretty unfavorable uh, verdict. It's t time to try something else where we actually work together for the common good of the country to move that ball forward. And uh, we've tried this last experiment for the last uh, couple of years. It hasn't worked, so let's let's try this one. And you'll have two partners then in the White House who will be able to work with their respective caucuses to be leaders to say, "Come on, let's let's get it together." This is would be a sea change if it. Yeah. Happened. Oh, I mean, absolutely. This, this, and you talked about <clears throat> uh, my political observations. I ask you about yours, Ken. You you know about political polarization. I mean, you saw it even when you were in office, not as bad as it is today. <clears throat> Can you really get a Republican and a Democrat on a ticket to peacefully coexist? Is that something that you can do? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, right now, No Labels has been enormously successful in doing that, drawing from disaffected members of both political parties uh, to build a national organization. Uh, you know, you asked, you posed the hypothetical of, well, what would actually happen if you had this third party uh, in the White House where you have a Republican and Democrat president, vice president, and you said, well, they wouldn't have any members of their respective parties in the Congress. Well, actually, they would. 
it would be composed almost 100 percent of Republicans and Democrats. And Bernie Sanders would feel really bad. You know. <laughs> but, you know, you might have this um, remarkable phenomenon, Rick, where the focus then becomes on ideas. The focus then becomes on the challenges facing the country and how do we meet these challenge, challenges. And the focus then becomes on where are the consensus solutions? What are the things that we agree on and unite us? not on the things that divide us. Um, I think that prospect is a, a, a pleasant one and an enviable one. So now, we're a long way from there, uh, admittedly. But when you have over 50% of Americans saying they can't countenance a Trump Biden contest in November, there's an opening for this. And one other thing to add, Rick, I was one of John McCain's national chairs back in 08. He came this close to picking Joe Lieberman That's as his won. running mate. He did. I mean, I traveled the country with John, lots of places. Lieberman was off it on that plane, and we had our own <clears throat> private jet that we, we did around. And they had a great bond. Uh, and you see that more often now in the Senate. I mean, in legislation that I worked on, cures and everything else, uh, some real positive bipartisan relationships knowing that they know th to get things done you have to have 60 votes versus just like jam it through and win by one or two votes and so those relationships are important so you could stimu you could simulate that same ex uh, experience then with a new ticket of two people quite compatible with each other with sort of a, a, a background agenda that's that's uh, positive. Can I, can I emphasize something, Rick? Um, this is not a Pollyannish concept here. Um, th this movement, this national movement, is composed of, of people who are very realistic um, and politically astute. People like Fred here. Um, you know, they're uh, doing what needs to be done today to create and uh, make sure there's an opportunity should things develop in such a way that there's a viable uh, chance for uh, a third party ticket, a different ticket than Trump Biden. They're realis realistic, practical people. Um, it, it's not just some kind of Pollyannish movement that's going to ignore reality, but it's time in this country for this kind of thing to happen. What's happened today is the sort of the business model of the two political parties uh, is to demonize the other. You know, we want to make sure, in other words, that if you're a Republican uh, candidate or a Republican party, we just want to make sure that the Democratic candidate is so demonized that they're a little bit more of a demon than our candidate. That's not the politics that solves problems in America. What does the coming presidential election hold in store over the next several months? When we come back, a final thought on that, to the point. Quick read of national polling data could lead one to conclude that Biden and Trump are the inevitable candidates of the two major parties and that a third party candidacy is a long shot. A closer look shows serious concerns about both of the front runners and many voters wanting other choices. All that could set up an interesting dynamic for 2024, something we'll be following when you join us each week. To the point.